Well, good morning, Hope Church Bedlington. We're going to get started in just a second. It's um, fantastic to be with you together. Hello, and my name's Tom, and I want to welcome you to Hope Church Bedlington. Morning, and my name's Joe, and I really want to welcome you into our home this morning from where we're doing church, and other people are doing church from their homes this morning. It's great to be with you. Even though we're physically apart, let's be emotionally and spiritually together this morning. If you're new, um, I want to especially welcome you this morning. So if you've not been here before, you are especially welcome. Let us know who you are by commenting uh, below or send us a private message. And for the rest of us, as we worship our God together, let's not be passengers this morning. Get involved, comment, share, start a watch party. If you want us to pray for something, send that to us in a, in a private message. And, um, and we will use those prayers and any encouragement you've got also after the worship during a time of prayer. We're going to head over to the Brewery household. Come on over with us. As we do that, if we're able, let's stand together. Let's put aside the things from the week. Let's forget about the news. Let's turn off our notifications and let's worship our things together. Morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Let's worship together as we start by singing At Your Name.
remember as we worship God this morning that God's in control of everything. We sing this song over us. So let's just concentrate our minds, our hearts on Him right now. I have heard so many songs Listen to a thousand tongues But there is one that sounds above them all The Father's Son Thanks, Gary. Um, despite all the challenges that we have, that we that we face connecting like this, it's so good to, and special to worship together in our homes this morning. Uh, during during worship, the encouragement came to us that we should not uh, forget to do good and to share with others for such as um, for the such sacrifices God is is pleased. That comes from Hebrews 13, and and we're going to come together now, and we're going to we're going to pray and. As we pray together, I want to encourage you, if you're with somebody else, if you're in a family or in a household or with a friend, um, I, I want to encourage you to, to just take their hand, take the hand of the person next to you. And if you're on your own, why not reach out your hands to the, uh, to the screen or, or, or in front of you, just as a sign that we are, we are connected to each other and to God. And um, let's not be passive here. Let's raise our hands, raise our voices, and let's pray. Let's pray for those um, around you, let's bless them, let's encourage them, and we've got a few things as well to pray for um, or to pray over that are coming during that time. This time, so let's just use the next few moments to pray. Pray for those around you, pray a real blessing on them, and um, and don't just be passive. Engage with this for a moment. Lord, I want to pray. Uh, today we all want to pray for those who are sick, particularly with this virus, God. We want to pray you um, you would touch them, God, that they would know you and that you would heal them. Lord, we do pray for a, a change in the in the tide that we're facing globally here. Lord, we pray that you would reverse it. God, we want to pray for those who have lost loved ones during this time. God, we pray for those that are struggling with finances, that have lost income or that face um, difficulties and challenge, economic challenges at the moment. And God, we want, to, um, we want to pray for those that are working on the front line, that are being, uh, taking on the, the fight and putting themselves at risk for the sake of others. God, we thank you for these, these prayers and we pray that you have blessed them. And God, as we, as we move on from this time of prayer, thank you that you are with us and that you do hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. Well, um, I've got quite a few announcements and a notice to share with you this morning. First of all, we are taking up the coronavirus offering um, for people in Bedlington and the wider area and across the world. So if you have not been able to give to that yet and you would like to, if you personal message us on the Facebook page, then we can give you the details of how to do that. 
if you haven't already received that in your email already. Um, next up, slightly sad um, news that Catalyst Festival has been cancelled. Really sorry about that, but it's not surprising in this current climate. Um, the good news is, if you've already paid up, you can transfer that over to next year. It can roll over and you will get next year's festival at this year's prices, so that's great news. But if you would like a refund, you can head on over to their website and get your refund through there. Next up, um, we have our church small groups and connect groups meeting again this week. So your leaders will be in touch and make sure you're connecting into those. Let's not miss out on meeting together and get involved with that this week. Kids Church, how exciting kids, Kids Church. So Kids Church will be happening after this church meeting. You will have, your parents will have had an email to tell you how to access that and it's going to be via Zoom online. So the kids will be meeting together after this meeting here now. Finally, church prayer meeting on the 7th. Again, let's not miss out church, let's keep meeting together, let's keep pressing in. We'll be doing that via Zoom as well, just like we're doing stuff this morning, online, via Zoom. Um, if you haven't got Zoom, get in touch with us, we can tell you how to get on and we can get you plugged in. It's, um, it's wonderful to have Helen sharing with us from the Brow household this morning. We're deep into our series, How Beautiful on the Mountain, on the feet of those who bring good news. We are all about the gospel as Christians, at least we should be all about the gospel, we should be all about the good news. And, but we come in our series to a moment when Jesus is arrested. And I can't wait, Helen, to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Well, good morning, good morning. and welcome, and welcome to Online Hope Church. My name is Helen, I'm part of the leadership team at Hope Church. And it's very strange doing this by a video link, but it's also just so good to do this and just to know that we are still connected together. You know, whether we are physically together in person as we usually are on a Sunday morning, or we are scattered around in our homes like we are right now, it's just so good to remember that we are still one body together with one heart, which is to love Jesus, to love each other, and to love and serve the communities that we live in, and to reach some of the gospel. And I think that's as true today as it was three weeks ago. You know, we love the gospel, we love Jesus, we're passionate about people knowing Jesus for themselves. And today we're continuing with our gospel series called How Beautiful on the Mountains are the Feet of Those Who Bring Good News. And we're going to be thinking today about Jesus' arrest before he's taken for trial and to be, to be nailed to the cross. And today I just want to take a few minutes to think about how Jesus responds to his arrest. And I also want to look at how Peter responds to the, to the arrest of Jesus. And I want us to think about what we can learn from these two very different responses. Okay, so let's read the passage. If you've got a Bible at home, um, follow me in it. And um, we're going to be reading from Matthew 26, verses 47 to 49. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a, lot, was a large... Sorry. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas says, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested that. With that, one of Jesus' companions, Peter, reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And in Luke's gospel we read um, about this event as well. And it says, And one of them struck the servant of the high priest in the ear, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. 
So let's just start by taking a little look at Peter's response to this, okay? So Jesus is hanging out with his friends, like he's teaching them, and suddenly a whole army of people approach him with swords and clubs, and they come to arrest Jesus. And Peter's response is to lash out at, the, at one of the men, Malchus. He's there to arrest Jesus. You know, Peter's angry. He loves Jesus. He's offended by this person trying to arrest Jesus. He sees an injustice towards Jesus and he wants to protect him and stop the injustice. So in a moment of impulsivity, of anger, of hate towards that Malchus, he lashes out and he strikes off his ear with a sword. Peter's reaction, it can seem a little bit strange. You know, he's been with Jesus for three years. He's heard Jesus talk again and again on, on loving each other, of loving your enemy, of being a peacemaker. Yet in impulse of haste, he acts in violence towards Malchus. His actions come from a place of offence. And Jesus rebukes him. Because actually, Peter has totally missed the heart of God. He's totally missed that actually what's happening to Jesus and him being arrested is part of the plans, part of the purposes of God to restore God's beloved people back to him. That is the prophets and scripture spoke of what Jesus himself were told Peter and his disciples of. God's heart. And therefore his plan was to restore his people to him. And that the only way that this was possible was to be through a Messiah. And Jesus, he was that Messiah. And you know, Peter had previously declared that Jesus is the Messiah. Yet in his haste in this situation, he doesn't act from a place of, of knowing Jesus' heart of love and of peace. And understanding and knowing what scripture has said about the promised Messiah. But instead, he acts out of his own anger, his own sense of injustice. And, you know, I think we get to know Peter quite well through the New Testament. You know, we, we know Peter's story, don't we? He's a fisherman. Fishermen in those days were educated, but they would have worked incredibly hard and probably with a lot of bravery in rough seas and fish markets. And being a fisherman, that would have, that would have been their identity. That would have been what they were known for, who they were. Yet one day, whilst Peter's having an unsuccessful, really frustrating day of fishing, Jesus comes along and he tells them, cast your nets over the other side of the boat. And the nets, they're filled with fish. And in that moment, Peter recognises something of himself and something of Jesus. And he says in Luke 5, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. So he sees in that moment that Jesus is Lord and he recognises his own sin. He has a revelation of who he is and he has a revelation of who Jesus is. And Jesus responds to him by saying, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for men. You see, Jesus sees something in Peter. He's, he knows the plans he has, the purposes he has for Peter's life. And Peter sees something in Jesus and he drops everything, including his very identity as a fisherman. And he begins this journey with Jesus that we see in the New Testament. And through this journey, you know, Peter, he makes a whole heap of mistakes. He walks on water, but then he immediately doubts Jesus and he plunges into the sea. He tells Jesus off when Jesus foretells them of his death and his resurrection. He says, no, Jesus, you're wrong. This isn't going to happen. Peter, he is rash. He is full of uncontrolled emotion he's ambitious he's quick to commit and state that he's fully in without fully understanding the implications so much so that he denies Jesus three times at his greatest moment of need and suffering Peter so often acts out of just raw emotion like he does in this story in the garden of Gethsemane where he acts out of anger and offense and chopping off Malchus' fear but you know what if you read on from this, you will find that the story of Peter is, is truly wonderful because Jesus absolutely transforms Peter. You know, it's a process, it's a journey, it takes time, it takes effort, but Jesus doesn't cast Peter aside when he messes things up. But instead, he takes him through this beautiful process of transformation. And what we see in Peter is that if we were to continue through this story, is a wise, self-controlled leader in the church, a rock Jesus stays on which Jesus uses to build his church. You know, the books that he writes that we see in the New Testament are full of wisdom and of grace. And I think that's such good news for us, isn't it? 
Because Jesus doesn't leave us where we're at. He doesn't leave us in the mess that we sometimes make. He doesn't leave us stuck in the mistakes that we sometimes get ourselves in. He doesn't leave us in the patterns of destruction that we can sometimes get ourselves in or our character flaws. But he pays the ultimate price for, for all of our sin, for all of our mess ups at the cross. And then like Peter, he takes us on this beautiful journey of transformation. And Jesus is absolutely committed to that. He's absolutely committed to you and, your, and his relationship with you. And he chooses the relationship that he chooses, that he wants to have with you. And we see Jesus demonstrating that commitment to us in Peter's story. And I just love Peter's story because I just think it gives us so much hope. Peter, yes, he acts out of offense and anger here and Jesus rebukes him for that. But he's on a journey with Jesus, a journey in which he ultimately is transformed by Jesus. Jesus, however, in this passage, he, he acts very differently to Peter. You know, Jesus absolutely knows the heart of God. He knows the plans. He knows the big picture. He knows, as we've repeatedly spoken about in this series, that God's heart is to have a people who are his own, a people who love him, who are loved by him, and who are in relationship with him. Jesus knows that him going to the cross as a sacrifice for us, for our sin, is the only way that this can be achieved. Mankind can't do it on their own. They can't live up to the perfect holiness of God and live in perfect obedience to God. We needed his sacrifice. We needed him to die in our place and take the punishment we deserve for our sin on him. So that now in humility and repentance for our sin, we can come to the Father and receive that forgiveness and relationship with him. And we can know we can enjoy his presence at work in our lives. Jesus knows the Father's heart and he acts out of that place. Jesus acts out of the love of the Father's heart. And isn't it just, I know I love this, I love this, but it's so beautiful that Jesus' last miracle on earth before he goes to the cross is to heal the, man, the ear of a man who was about to arrest him. You know, one who we would see as a great enemy of Jesus, someone who like he despised Jesus, wanted to hurt him, wanted to destroy him in a moment of what is unimaginable stress, what unimaginable pressure for Jesus in his full humanity, you know, knowing he's going to be beaten and tortured and ultimately hung on a cross. What does Jesus do? He extends a hand over to his enemy. He touches his ear and he heals him. What beautiful mercy. And I looked up the definition of mercy and said this, mercy is a love that responds to human need in an unexpected or unmerited way. And we know that Jesus was about to show the greatest act of mercy that has or ever will be done in dying on the cross for us. It's a totally undeserved and unmerited act of mercy and love for us. Peter acts out of anger and offence. Jesus rebukes him because it's not the heart of God, but he doesn't leave him in his mess up. Instead, he takes him on this beautiful journey of transformation. Jesus, on the other hand, he acts out of perfect love and out in mercy, he heals the man about to arrest him. As he knows, he understands the heart of God and he acts from that place. And you know, the place that we choose to respond out of is so important. Both Peter and Jesus were in highly pressured, scary situations. Yet they displayed very different responses. Peter chose to respond from a place of anger and frustration. Jesus chose to respond from a place of love and of mercy. And you know, none of us can miss right now that we are smack bang in the middle of, you know, strange and scary times of this horrific coronavirus pandemic. And I've been so challenged this week through this story that we more than ever, I think, need to think about how we respond at a time like this. You know, we need to consider whether we're going to respond from a place of you know, fear, of frustration, of anxiety, or are we going to respond out of a place of knowing the Father's heart and therefore choosing love and mercy and servant-heartedness, knowing that what God's word says and making that our foundation right now, making that the platform from which we make decisions, making that what guides our response. And you know, for many of us, we'll have all sorts of emotions going on in our heads right now. For some, it will be a time of real fear, especially those who are maybe in the vulnerable groups or those who have, you know, family or friends in the vulnerable groups. And that emotion is absolutely okay. You know, please hear that. 
No, I believe that God created us to be emotional beings. I think Jesus is an emotional being. I think the New Testament shows us so many occasions that, that and we see Jesus displaying really strong emotion. But the choice that we have to make is are we going to respond from that place of fear? Say, just like Peter responded from that place of anger and offence. You know, are we younger folks going to ensure that we're at the front of that shop queue and stockpiling months and months and months of food and, and, and fear of running short whilst that 85-year-old neighbour living by herself can't get a pint of milk and a loaf of bread to last a couple of days? Are we going to, yes, acknowledge that fear? Because that, that's really important but actually choose not to respond from that place. Because actually, we know that God says in Matthew 6, look at the birds in the air. They don't plant or harvest or store in barns. But your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable to him than them? Because I know that for me and for my family, I want to respond from that place. I don't want to respond from my fear of my kids, from my kids right now. But I want to respond from a place of knowing the heart of God knowing the promises he speaks over us and therefore loving and looking out for my neighbour instead, buying what we need for this week, but not hoarding a load of excess, trusting God's words when he says he's going to provide. Or for some of us, we might find the uncertainty of the present situation just really frustrating. And actually our response to that frustration is to just completely shut ourselves away, not just physically, which of course is right that we follow government guidelines and that in order to protect the vulnerable, but also emotionally. Because actually, you know, to love your neighbour right now, it's kind of hard to work. It requires more of you than it usually does. You know, it might require you to pick up a phone a lot more regularly and call those who are isolated and lonely right now. Maybe to set up a WhatsApp group to support the uh, more vulnerable people who live around you. Maybe to wait in a queue and pick up the shopping of an elderly labourer rather than just, you know, the polite conversation you normally have in the group, in, on your street, sorry or your normal kind of usual, you know, I don't know, social action project that you quite comfortably normally engage with. Maybe when you pick up your allocated two cart cartons of milk that the shop requires, you know, give them one to your elderly neighbour who doesn't have any, and just have them less yourself. Maybe it requires you to think of your finances, you know, could you bless a food project like the Matthew Project in Bedlam right now? Could you give into our, into our offering that's there to, to serve the community and serve need in the community right now? In order, you know, to feed those who are vulnerable and struggling more than ever right now. You know, it takes you out of your natural comfort zone, doesn't it? Of what you normally do in response to God's command to love your neighbour. And that can feel uncomfortable. And that can emotionally require more of you. But how are you going to respond to that? Are you going to respond from that place of comfort and that feeling of just wanting to emotionally hide away in order to deal with the uncertainty of this time? Or are you going to respond from a place of knowing the Father's heart and knowing that Jesus was willing to make himself incredibly uncomfortable for you so that you could be in relationship with God? And knowing that, are you going to allow yourself to just be a bit uncomfortable so that you can love your neighbour well through this time now. You know, I want to follow Jesus as an example. I want to know the Father's heart deeply. I want to respond from that place. I want to choose mercy in the face of an enemy. I want to choose not to act out of offence and anger like Peter did, but instead to act out of the Father's heart of love and grace and kindness. I want to choose not to set myself up in an emotional bubble in the comfort of my home. Instead, I want to choose to step out of that, step out of that emotional comfort zone and love my neighbour. You know, make that phone call to connect with those who are lonely and isolated, even if I find that quite an uncomfortable thing to do. You know, I, I want to choose the Father's heart. I want God's word to be my platform from which I respond at this time. Shall we pray together? And I'm going to hand back over to Tom and Joe. God, I just thank you so much that you were willing to make yourself incredibly uncomfortable for us, Lord God, that you were willing to go to the cross for us, Lord God, so that we could have the joy and the blessing of knowing the Father, God. And Jesus, I just pray that this time, Lord God, I pray that you help us to be people who choose your heart, Lord God. I pray that you help us to be people who don't just set ourselves up in an emotional comfort zone, Lord God, but God, who continue to love our neighbours, to look out for our neighbours, God. God, we want to be people who choose mercy, who choose love, who choose grace, who choose compassion, even in the face of fear and anxiety and, a, and difficult times, Lord God. 
Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Angel. Well, thank you, Helen. That is absolutely amazing to hear this morning. And, and I know that Helen has worked really hard on that and she's been out serving the NHS all this week, night shifts and everything. And, and it was really great this week to cheer on our NHS and those workers. And just as we respond to Helen's words this week, let's remember those people who are out on the front line, not just the NHS workers, but the people in the shops, the delivery drivers, the milkmen, the police that have all got a really tough job at the moment. And let's be responding, um, not from our kingdom of comfort this week. I really feel challenged about that. No, I don't want to be in my kingdom of comfort this week, but I want to be responding to people around me from a place where where Jesus would, Jesus would, and I know his heart, and I want to live that out. So I encourage you this week, let's do that together. If you feel like you don't know who Jesus is this morning, if you feel like you're not really on that journey of transformation yet that Helen was talking about, and you'd like to know a little bit more about that, then please do get in touch with us through the direct messaging, and someone would love to chat with you about that. Okay, well, um, thank you everyone for taking part this morning. Kids, in a minute, it will be your turn. Log in through Zoom. Your parents have got the link to that through their email. And um, listen, when we've got small groups this week, whether that's Bible study or our Connect group or our prayer group, keep pressing in. Don't take a back step. Push in through these, uh, these different ways that we can connect. And um, let's pray that God uses this week really powerfully, that his kingdom would be reigning in your homes and in, in the lives of those you come into uh, contact with. Keep safe uh, and keep other people safe, even more importantly. Keep the faith and um, we really look forward to seeing you next week. Matt should stay out.